If you have them, where was I? But please do not interrupt proceedings if you do indeed need to speak with one of them. The meeting generally proceeds with the staff calling the case and describing it. I will call for the applicant to come forward afterward to add to the basic description of the, of the request if necessary or if the applicant wishes to do so. If so, the applicant should keep the presentation to 10 minutes or less. The commissioners will then have the opportunity to ask questions. At, that, at this point, I will ask if there is anyone in the audience who wishes to speak for or against the proposal. The audience comments shall be kept to two minutes per person. If there is, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond. This rebuttal shall not exceed five minutes. So 10 minutes, two minutes, and five minutes. In most of the cases, we will make a decision tonight after all information has been presented. If your case is denied or if you feel that our decision was made in error, you and anyone withstanding have the opportunity to appeal it within 30 days of the decision. If you plan to speak about the project, a specific project, you must have signed in the sheet at the back, on the sheet at the back of the room. Also, and so that members of the public understand, commissioners are under strict instructions to avoid discussing DDRC meetings and applications with members of the public or with each other outside of these proceedings to avoid ex parte communications. If you wish to speak during the course of these proceedings, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth in these proceedings? Thank you. Uh, would staff please call roll? Mr. Bachnight? Here. Mr. Brain? Here. Mr. Cohn? Here. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Here. Mr. Heiler? Here. Mr. Savory? Here. We have quorum. Great. Does the agenda still stand? The agenda stands. Okay. Meaning that uh, we will skip the consent agenda and uh, approval of that and minutes since we don't have those and go straight to our case. If you'd please introduce it. Certainly. So the case before you today is a request to modify the Seminary Ridge Architectural Conservation District. This district has been in existence since 2013, and the neighborhood has recently expressed interest in lessening their review. Therefore, the request is to keep a historic district, but in the form of a protection area. As a recap, protection areas and architectural conservation districts are both considered to be historic districts, but have differing levels of review. Architectural conservation districts focus on preserving original materials and architectural features, such as windows, doors, siding, etc., and original detailing on a structure. Protection areas typically have regulations which preserve basic forms, fenestration patterns, and so on, but focus less on keeping original materials and details. City staff has held meetings and worked with the neighborhood to craft new guidelines, which are included as part of your packet, along with the old guidelines. The new guidelines include review of new construction, demolition, relocation, and additions, which are standard review items in protection areas. That's it in a nutshell, but I'm happy to answer any questions y'all might have. Any questions from commissioners? Amy, what is the procedure for making this adjustment? It, you know, it goes through, what process right. has it's, it gone through? It's the same as, um, <laughs> as it was to put it into place. So this has been to planning commission for a recommendation. Y'all will make a recommendation today of one kind or another. Both of those recommendations will go to city council, and city council is the board that actually makes the decision as to whether to approve the proposal or not. I want to get a little more granular. Where exactly what got it to planning commission? Um, we had an application. Or, or the DDRC. Mm -hmm. We had an application properly signed um, from Councilman Davis, who brought it to the planning commission. Um, Planning Commission is, this is actually a text and map amendment to the ordinance. Every historic district overlay is. So um, those require an application to amend the ordinance, so that's where we started with this. Um, and those applications may only be signed by certain people in city government. So city council person, um, 
city manager. There are a small handful of people who are permitted to sign those as an application. And that's how it was received. Um, okay. And of course, our, you know, it's In all done. In terms of community involvement, neighborhood, neighborhood board, you know, who, who, what, what has been the process? Right, I know what process gets it here. Right. Protected. I just interested in knowing what process gets it right the, the president of the neighborhood association um, let us know that there was interest in the neighborhood about the uh, discussing the change to the guidelines so we met with the neighborhood several times i think three times to talk with them about what the change in regulations would mean um, and to get their feedback as to what they were looking for in terms of a historic district okay. was that neighborhood meeting or neighborhood board meeting well, those are meetings by the city in response to a request from the neighborhood board. And so we um, contacted through postcards every property owner we had on record in, within okay. the historic district. So it's the same process you go through to It's exactly the same process. The yes, indeed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to have that, that uh, process out there. That was good. I need a technical support. I don't have anything on my screen. You don't have a screen? Yeah. All right, thank you. If we could get some technical support for Mr. Broom. Pull that over in the meantime. Anybody else have any questions? No? Uh, is the applicant, somebody representing the applicant here who would like to present? Thanks. Could you please uh, state your name? Yes, Mike Kimball, and I'm the president of the Seminary Ridge Neighborhood Association. Uh, we started this um, uh, last year under different leadership, and um, uh, the process has been good. I'm, I'd like to commend the, the planning committee or the, the, the your staff, the planners, the city planners, for working so well with us. We we've we've got communicated information out to all the neighborhoods uh, or to all of the, the neighborhood um, through email, um, through Facebook. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion. The majority of the neighborhood has uh, decided that, uh, that they, they want this change. Uh, we had several meetings with the city where I know they must have uh, felt like they were herding cats because uh, one meeting we might be one way and the next meeting we'd come together a little bit different direction. But I, I'm really thankful for the way the community really came together and became more involved in this than probably they have in anything before much more involved in, in this and in keeping it a historic district um, than they were when they originally adopted the original. And I, and I think the community has been educated uh, in the process so we know uh, what's possible and what's not. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody have any questions before we move on to any others? I have a question. The, uh, the guideline for 2013, are there anybody here when this guideline was adopted? Are there others? Uh, first, let's uh, ask for anybody who would like to speak in support of this. State your name, please. Lance Folsom. I see why Latoya wanted to be on this body. Very sharp questions. And the business about how we arrived today is something I think is really critical. Back in 2012 and before, uh, our association was just kind of on life support in a sense, and Latoya took over and made it much better, but as we discussed uh, being an historic district, it sounded good, but nobody really knew what it was, was except Latoya. And at the meeting we went to, we were out of town from a couple of them, we only had six or seven people, and um, you know, there was very little discussion or whatever, one person was against it. But as we've implemented this, a lot of our neighbors have talked to us, for instance, walking around the neighborhood about, I want to put windows in, but it's so expensive, or my house is cold, I need insulated windows. So it became apparent that it was a little bit too strict for our neighborhood. Uh, somebody may present information that we have a low to moderate income neighborhood. So this uh, architectural conservation district seems to be a little stiff. Anyway, we had meetings, and uh, the attendance was like 20 to 30 people uh, at our neighborhood meetings to talk about this. So. 
lot of input, and we didn't know if we wanted to do away with it, but I think we've come to realize it's a great thing to have to protect our neighborhood, but it's a little too strict for a lot of our residents to be able to afford to fix their houses up, you know, make them energy efficient. So we'd appreciate your help in helping us to make our neighborhood a little better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in support? Afternoon. I'm Brian Bergen, I'm a homeowner in Seminary Ridge. I just want to um, offer a little backup to what Lance said in terms of people not being able to afford it. I think this was a really great experiment. Um, I was actually in favor of it when we first went through it. But what we found out is we simply can't afford it. The um, median income in that neighborhood is $25,000. When you compare that to the other historic neighborhoods on the north side of town, Cotton Town, where the average is 50, or excuse me, the median is 57, and Elmwood, where it's 47, the, neighbor, the people that live there simply can't afford to do the upkeep on their home in a historic manner or to meet the historic guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak in support before we move to the other? Hi. I'm Mary Harrigan. I am Ann Tennant of a house in Seminary Ridge. And I want to tell you that by changing it, I understand the architectural thing. I can't come from Saratoga Springs, New York, which is a really historical area, upstate New York. So I know what the historical guidelines are and stuff like that. But where we are now, we really want to keep the historical look, but changing the windows, et cetera, would be helpful. I pay a nice amount for rent, but my electrical bill one month was $250. And I keep my heat at 68. I don't raise it any higher, don't lower it, nothing. And to walk around with a sweat jacket on and full pants, it's just a little kind of crazy. By changing windows and doing things like that, not making them modern, modern, but at least energy efficient windows, would help out the people like me who can't. I mean, I, I'd love to buy a house in the neighborhood, but at, at the rate it's going, it would cost me $150,000 for a house that's not worth $150,000. And I would like to be able to be able to to have the landlord put windows in so that I can feel comfortable in there, so that more people come into the neighborhood. So we are a neighborhood where we have families. We can know that our neighbors are our neighbors. I mean, know the people. I don't know only about four people on my block. Whereas it would be nice to be able to have people who can get in there, who can afford to be in there, to fix the houses up the way they need to be fixed, but keep the historical value so that we can say, hey, look, they've done this and this looks great. To keep the neighborhood a neighborhood, a beautiful neighborhood. And having the windows the way they are now, you pretty much can't. I can't. Some of my windows won't open. They are the ones with the ropes in them because I can't get them open because the ropes have snapped. So we've got, you know, I know how to fix to open the windows so safety wise, but still I can't replace those windows and I can't ask my landlord to do it because it's not what we're, you know, it's not in the historical the preservation or whatever it is. I just want to be able to, you know, as a tenant, have tenants in the neighborhood too that also can afford to live there, don't have to worry about huge electric bills, and somebody who wants to stay. I want it to be a neighborhood to where everyone enjoys it. And being a tenant, I look at the tenants that come in there, landlords got windows and plastic on the, on the doors. That's not what you want in your neighborhood. You don't want people to see that. I know why they put the plastic to keep the energy, the, the heat in, but it doesn't look good. It doesn't look like a neighborhood that I would want to live in. I'd be afraid to walk down the street if I, you know, un understandably, I know who they are anyways. But the whole point is, is that by having the ability to us, to the landlord, to modify the windows, I would be able to stay there. And I would have neighbors that I could trust. I know that they're good people. I don't want neighbors who, neighbors who are going to be fly by the night, two months down the road, take off because the landlord won't be able to fix anything or it's too high for them to live there. And we, I do have elderly neighbors who would just would be able, love to be able to fix the windows in the houses. So. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak in support? I forgot to ask the others. Have you been sworn in? Um, I think I did. You raise your right hand and promise to tell the truth. Yes, sir. And state your name, please. Nino Colorossi. I'm a property owner at um, Seminary Ridge, too. And, um, you know, when we first started this um, to change the uh, historic overlay, 
we did a survey and Mike, Mike Kimball did most of the leg work and he went around the whole neighborhood and he surveyed the properties that already have updated um, things like windows and doors and siding. There's, there's about 30% of the houses in our neighborhood that already have those updates done. So uh, changing it to a protection area would just fit into what most of the people have, or a good portion of the people have already done in our neighborhood anyway. So, and plus, um, like Mary just said, it, it allows the historic uh, designation to stay in place. It's just a little less stringent than it is now. And I think it'll, it'll also um, be important for, there's a lot of um, landlords in there that simply don't do anything to the houses at all. And, and my wife Tina and I own a house right next door to a landlord that, that doesn't do anything and they kind of hide behind the historic um, conservation district now. We want to put windows in but we can't do it and so they kind of hide behind that stuff and so therefore you see houses like that that just fall farther and farther into disrepair. And our, and our property values are, are a result of that. So we'd appreciate to, uh, to be able to change it to keep it protection. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in support? Is there anybody? Yes. And I, I, I think I need to swear you in if you'd raise your right hand. Yes. Sir. Promise to tell the truth in these proceedings. Absolutely. Yes, sir. And then your I, name. Gregory Hildebrand. I apologize for being late, but I got caught up in traffic on the way here. Uh, I have a lifelong connection with the neighborhood. Uh, I was actually, that was where my parents lived when I was born. Still own property over there and take a lot of pride in that neighborhood. Uh, I think that all these folks have probably told you what our feelings are about that it would enable some people to make property improvements that otherwise may not be able to. And yet we would still be preserving some historic, you know, significance like, with this. So uh, I uh, just wanted to uh, thank you for your consideration and hope that you will look at it closely. And uh, I think everybody uh, has the neighborhood in the, uh, uh, in their best interest in this, and they're, they're really interested. I, I haven't seen this many people involved in anything in that neighborhood uh, in years, so uh, that's, that's a good thing, just to bring people together. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Anyone here who wants to speak in opposition? Yes, sir. Have you been sworn in? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And if you could state your name, please. Uh, Robert Hendricks. I forwarded an email last, uh, well, this morning to Amy. Uh, in it, I stayed up to about four o'clock compiling in some information from the uh, Richland County Assessor's Office, which calculated the values of all the homes in the area. Also, it calculated the values of the loss that's going to happen if we change this tax amendment. There's a $4 million loss that's going to happen to the property owners for this tax amendment being changed. Just for a few um uh, maybe five or six out of 170 people that belong to this thing, uh, they want to change and cost a, an average of $27,000 loss to each homeowner in the community just for some windows. There is a process for them to appeal as an individual to get their windows to the DDRC or the zoning board or whatever. There also, if you look, and I have to look this up, in... Uh, case law, there is a, is a law specifically which states that and you should have a copy of the email. Which page are you on? Uh, hold on. Uh, right here on the email itself to Amy. Which page? Right. Which page? It's, a, the, uh, it's just one page for the email okay. right here. Oh, I, we don't have that. I can, I can make sure you have a copy of this. I need the. Oh, okay. okay. The the case law states in Lovering versus Seabrook Island Property Owners Association, the court ruled that a corporation may exercise only those powers which are granted to it by law. 
and acts beyond corporation powers are defined as ultra virus. Seminary Ridge Neighborhood Association is not a homeowners association. They do not have the power to speak for any homeowner. There's 170 homeowners that value. There's a church that's valued at $2 million in this property or whatever that stands to lose $400,000 just over some windows. There's property owners that stand to lose more money just because somebody wants to get a window when there is a process for them to come and ask the zoning commission to let them put their windows in. So I ask that we stop this process and protect the zoning commission, I mean zoning laws of the people and preserve the historic properties in this house. By the way, our house was built in 1924. It was built by my wife's grandfather by a um, architect at the time, which was really uncalled for back then. And I'm proud of that house. I mean, her, her father is, uh, I think you've heard of the school, Alcorn Middle School. Her father is the one that built that house. So this house has been there since 1924 and has been in the family since 1924. And it deserves the, the house on the end, Keenan House. That's a historic house in the district and it stands to lose money. The actual price of what it'll lose is in that list that I give you. So again, I ask that the, you think about this and help, help stop us losing our money on a value because the average homeowner will lose $27,000 with this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from commissioners? Discussion. And to address his point, and as part of the Tax Act of 2017, there's is a new local is a new empowerment zone legislation which only went into effect the end of March. It was, and we really don't know all the details, but it looks like the area north of Sunset, going out with Monticello on the west and perhaps Ferrara on the right, will be impacted by that, which gives some t new tax benefits for folks who re redo properties in those neighborhoods. It's all too early. The guidelines are not out. Uh, Central Midlands is, is putting something together for me as a real estate broker to know what areas it covers. But that's one thing that may counter what he just said. Secondly, but, excuse me, uh, Jim. When you say redo, do you mean uh, restore? No. Uh, the, 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 the act basically is what it was explained to me at the preservation conference. Says because the historic tax credits have been reduced from taking your credit in the year after the property goes into use, the tax historic tax credits. They now go into effect in a five-year plan. Mm -hmm. So Tim Scott was one of the proponents of this, and so what this new bill basically sets forth is that this is something that's supposed to work with the reduction in tax credits to make properties that might qualify for tax credits more attractive. Right now, the details are very much in the air, but the City of Columbia identified I think six or seven census bureaus, the bulk of which are north of Sunset slash Beltline. What we don't know at the present time is what neighborhoods are covered, but by what I've been told is that Monticello will be on the west, Fair Road will be on the right. And it offers incentives to those who want to come in and rehabilitate property and they can take their tax credit over a certain period of time when they sell the property. So is that uh, the right. Right. 
uh, they're actually online, but when you try to see what street are covered, it won't print, and that's what Central Midlands giving you. But it, but it is something that will defer tax gain, like he's talking about. Uh, I've looked at the Waverly Protection Area, which is the only one that I'm aware of that's like this. I've looked at the one you projected, and I looked at what they have right now. And the major changes that I see are what they now have required design review is outbuildings and carports would require DDRC approval. That's out. Uh, screening porches is typically reviewed by staff. That's out. What's been added to the do not require design requirements are fences and walls, uh, replacement of windows, sidings, and doors, uh, new construction of outbuildings and carports, demolition of outbuildings and carports, dormer additions, chimneys and roof materials, and porch railings and columns uh, do not now have to be reviewed by DDRC. So I think the big issues, as they've pointed out, is now you can replace the windows with that DDRC, and I'm assuming that means vinyl windows instead of wood windows could be used. Uh, some of the issues that have come up before are on things like porch railings and, and columns and the siding use wood, uh, vinyl, et cetera. Um, so I think, in a nutshell, what the new changes deal with is they want to have an easier way to replace their windows right. with either wood or vinyl windows. Uh, they want to have the ability to change uh, the porch railings and columns without any DDRC approval. And they want to be able to have Dormer additions, chimney, and roof materials dealt with by without DDRC a, a discussion. Is that basically it in a nutshell? That's largely it. Basically, okay. I think it's very. There was to one say, other one, I think, and that's uh, new construction of outbuildings and carports yeah, was right. added. So there are four right. items that were four. added to not needing review. That's correct. Right. So yeah, new construction additions, relocations, demolitions. Those are standard and minimum requirements for any protection area, which they have included. Driveways and parking areas are actually part of our city ordinance, so those are always included as well in any historic district. Um, and then changes to roof lines and reforms. Yeah. The real issues I see are windows, doors, and the type of siding. Right. And I, I think. You know, there are some other things, but I think those are the, the points that they were really struggling with. Thank you. But it is dating back to the mid-90s. Excuse me. It's, it, you have to. Uh, yeah, so we can hear. Speaking about that, one subject a minute. There was state a real your, estate state agent. your name again, please, uh, just Robert for the record. Hendricks. Thanks. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, speaking about the, the report, the, a real estate agent, uh, I put this report on Facebook last night, and a real estate agent looked at it, and he said that the value of our homes are going up. In other words, since in the last two years, the values of our homes are going up. They're not going down. And that's because of it being in this historic district. And the other thing is, you have to look at Main Street. Everything is dying on Main Street. Removing this is going to take that protection of these homes which are preserved to keep the economic balance and keep them preserved. So if you take away that balance, these homes are all going to dip in price, you understand, because everything on North Main is dipping. So the historic, historic district actually preserves economically our homes to keep them at their value. It retains that value. It's something if we remove that, the value is not guaranteed. And there's no report that contradicts that changing this will ch uh, say guarantee our value be preserved the only thing that's in in writing that's done by experts is the report i presented 
And I, I have on Facebook where a real estate agent said that, you know, as far as him selling property in the area, the prices are rising. So that's, that, that's in response to your question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mary Perry. I want to dispute what he's saying. I have three properties, 8, 820 Wildwood, 816 Wildwood, and 11, 1100 Columbia College. The two on Wildwood just dropped $10,000 in price, according to the online websites. $10,000. They went from $60,000 down to $50,000. And the one in Columbia, Drive, was purchased on uh, December 20th, 2017. It sold for $60,058. It's now on sale for $39,900. The property values will go up if we can make the changes. I, you can't buy a house and change anything, the windows, etc. If, and this is a prime example, and I, this person's probably a really nice person, but if, if I was to look at that house and say, okay, well, you can't change the windows, they've got to stay that way, I wouldn't purchase it. And that's part of the reason why I haven't looked in the house in the neighborhood, because of the windows and the doors. I have a wooden door that could be kicked in. I had to have the landlord put a kick plate in because I was afraid of being kicked in, and I'm home alone a lot. So he's telling us the property values will go up, and that's great that they, if they do go up, but everything else, projection-wise, they're saying forecasting it going up to 140, and this house is right now listed at 50,000. So they're not going up. If anything, they're going down because people see what the neighborhood looks like, and the changes you can't. This house, 62,000. Now it's down to 39.9, and I don't know the owner. And if I could have gotten hold of him, I probably would have, you know, at least tried to to find out why he's reduced it so much. Is it because of the windows and doors he can't change it, or is there something else going on? And I, I, can, I only brought the copies that I have, but you can see the property values aren't going up, the ones that are up for sale, at least, in the neighborhood. In, in something that's 23 years old, how much has changed in 23 years? We all have cell phones now. We didn't have them then. I, I'm old enough to know. <laughs> but basically, we're looking at a house values in there and grant you if the city did do some kind of a loan through the federal government and I, I worked on a commission a long time ago in upstate New York where they got a grant to help people fix up their houses and they gave them money you had to stay five years after five years you didn't have to pay it back but if you did something like that then that would help and and I appreciate all you guys are doing I really do and having being a tenant in the area I can see tenants don't stay because of the you know having to, uh, the added expense and it, it just doesn't work. The values aren't going up right now. And if we could change the windows and have the houses look a little more energy efficient, they would go up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, well, let me say this before we before the conversation goes on too much further. Our, our purview here is fairly narrow, and I think the commissioners, I, I think that uh, Ms. fuller Wills wanted to make a comment or ask a question, but uh, the procedure right now really is for us to deliberate, and if we have specific questions uh, for anybody in the audience, then um, that, that's the time to, to have that conversation. Uh, our purview is fairly narrow. I think we understand that uh, staff has worked uh, diligently with the neighborhood. Um, we understand that I think everybody on this side is, is uh, supportive of making this change. Uh, that's clear to us. I think that if we're going to talk about the individual prices of uh, individual homes, uh, as we just have heard, uh, that's going to last all night. Um, I think we understand that there is generally the will in the, in the neighborhood uh, as represented by, uh, by uh, Councilman Davis to, um, to make this change to uh, uh, less restrictive. Uh, I think one thing that needs to be clear, and I, I, I think most of us understand this, is that uh, this is not a proposal to uh, make this no longer a historic district. This doesn't do that. What this does is it re uh, relieves some of the uh, restrictions, taking it from an architectural conservation district to a protection area. My personal belief is that over time, in the aggregate, uh, it will have not as much of a, of a positive effect on property values over time in the aggregate. But I, I think that it's still, in my opinion, this is my opinion, uh, is better than having it not be an historic district at all. I, I'm concerned, uh, generally speaking, 
uh, with the precedent, the notion of the precedent of moving from an architectural conservation district to a protection area. Um, but I also see, and I think uh, somebody who spoke talked about a median income of somewhere around $25,000. So I think in this case, uh, unlike some other neighborhoods in the community, uh, that's a mitigating factor that I, I think that the commission probably would like to take into consideration. But I, uh, I think that we have heard uh, very well and very articulately and from, from both sides of the issue. If there's something different that, we, that needs to be, that we need to hear, if there's something different, then uh, please come forward. But please step to the microphone. If there's something different that we all already haven't discussed. The median income. I, I presented to you uh, a report that's backed by the Richland County uh, Tax Assessor's Office. You can go online, you can check. Every one of those values comes from the tax assessors. Every value comes from the report that I presented. The median income that was presented to you is conjecture. It isn't based by fact. There's no fact saying that our median income in the neighborhood is $25,000. We've only got maybe 10 people here, or maybe less, and there's 170 homes involved in this. So that doesn't qualify to say that the median income is at $25,000 because somebody comes up and stated. That doesn't make it fact. Thank you. Thank you. Sam Davis said at our meetings, um, Democracy in Action, uh, I'd like to refute or explain or clarify what our opponent here has said, that if five or six people in the neighborhood want to change windows, we voted and, you know, I'll admit that there are two votes per household if they're two property owners. Vote was 29 to 3. And uh, this man and his wife were two of them. So it's a pretty overwhelming sentiment in the neighborhood of people who care. And everybody had a chance to comment. Don't want you to think it's 51 to 49, because it's definitely not. Thank you. I ask, uh, Sir. Amy, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what was the overall representation of the neighborhood on this vote? You know on how many people? Issue. Yeah. Right. I couldn't tell you numbers. I mean, I think in, in any um, process like this across the neighborhoods over the years that I've seen, we notify every property owner of record and like anything else, hope that everybody comes out. Sure. Um, so everyone was equally notified, dates, times, you know, what the issue was, you know, and we had multiple meetings so people could come and respond. So Amy, to follow up on that, so there's been three community meetings, plus planning commission, plus tonight. Yes. So was each property owner notified five times? Um, I think we have out on the uh, neighborhood website the dates okay. the, um, of the meetings okay. coming up for city council. Okay. Yeah, and, and we scheduled it so that everyone would have notification sure. of the BDRC and planning okay. commission. And are you saying you don't know how many people from the neighborhood came to the meetings? I mean, I can give you rough numbers. We didn't, we don't take a, a vote, you know, we respond to the people who show up. Sure. You know, so we can't require a certain number of people come to the meetings. What we can do is speak to the people who attend and go from there. So do you have an approximate number of people that came to the meeting? Um, I would have to have the sign-in list, but I would say the very first meeting we had was maybe 30-ish, 35, yeah, somewhere around there. I just heard someone say that 29 voted for this change and three voted against it. So there were 32 people voting out of 100. Okay. Okay. Out of 170 residences? Or 340. Well, I think the point is that everybody was duly notified. Yeah, I think so. And right. I think that's really all we can. I, I think you do have to go with the people who actually show right. up. Right, to the right. Yeah, it, I think I'm it's. I'm not questioning that. Okay. I just can't believe the lack of interest. <laughs> hey, Amy, Amy, can I ask another question? Because it sort of, for me, boils down to two items. Uh, a dormer addition, particularly on the front of the house, could be substantial. Are we looking at dormer additions on the front or on the side? Uh, 
That, that still raises some concern to me that you could change. This is on page uh, seven of the seven. proposed. Uh, this could really change the appearance of the front. I mean, could we live with, or could they live with dormer additions that do not face the street? Uh, yes, we discussed. We discussed all of these things point by point. But, but they, they, they want any dormer, whether it's facing the street or the side or whatever, no dealing with that, and they're not in favor of that. Okay. Uh, porch railings and columns are other issues that can change dramatically the look of a property. That's correct. Uh, and they don't want any control over porch we, columns or railings. We did, we did discuss that. I, I think that the situation that we have is that the members of the, of the uh, neighborhood were duly notified. Uh, you, you can't drag people to meetings. If there were another 250 people that didn't want to uh, support this, that didn't show up and haven't spoken and aren't here today, then we don't know. We have no way of knowing that. I, I, I trust that uh, staff, I know that you take this uh, extremely seriously and uh, I don't know that um, a less restrictive scenario is um, necessarily something that we would be stridently supporting as a commission or certainly as staff with respect to an historic neighborhood, but I think that those who have spoken have, have spoken clearly both in support and opposed and are here today and have spoken several times. Um, I don't, I, you know, aside from other questions from commissioners, um, I, I would just add to that that Councilman Davis is very well tuned to what his constituents typically want, and I would not want to question his authority in putting this forward. I mean, if he believes that the neighborhood fully supports it, I, I don't think he would put this forward otherwise. Mr. Chairman, I'd be willing to make a motion, motion Please. to that point. I would move that we approve the Seminary Ridge Protection Area District Guidelines is there a date on these? Uh, you, you can just say as proposed. They as, be as proposed, be substituted in lieu of the Seminary Ridge Architectural Conservation District guidelines that were adopted in February 2013, and uh, ask that staff move these forward to City Council for public or discussion. At I think it's the May 15th City Council meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I would only like to reiterate the point that I made earlier that uh, I, I believe that this is a, a precedent that uh, the Design Development Review Commission should use rarely. I think that um, uh, ideally neighborhoods would understand what they are uh, doing when they designate an historic district and I'm, I am concerned about the slippery slope of going from one designation to a less restrictive designation. That said, you know, I think we've, we've heard a lot this afternoon. Um, personally, I trust staff to uh, understand and work with the communities, and I think it's more important that we understand that at least there is some value in an historic district uh, rather than not having an historic district at all. So uh, that's, that's my take on this. Can I ask one last question? What other neighborhoods have this protection area? We have several. Um, we have Waverly Protection Area, Old Chandon, Lower Waverly, Earlwood, all our protection areas. They, they include different things in their guidelines depending on what they're looking for. So there is a range of uh, you know, items for review. But those are all protection areas. Any more discussion before we move to a vote? If I might, the original motion did not pick up in the um, recording. Oh. And if you, Mr. Daniels, if, if you could just am note. I, am I working? Yeah. There you go. And if you could just note that this is a recommendation to city council. Okay. Uh, I would make the recommendation that this commission approve the revised Seminary Ridge Protection Area District Guidelines uh, to be adopted in lieu of the Seminary Ridge Architectural Conservation District Guidelines, which were adopted in February 2013.
Does that work? I think so, what I caught okay. of it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, assuming there's no further discussion, do we have a vote, please? Do we need a second to that uh, one? Well, yeah. Second, please. And I assume there's no further discussion, is there? No. Yeah, please have a vote. Mr. Bachnight? No. Mr. Brim? I must say yes. Mr. Cohn? No. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Heiler? Yes. Mr. Savory? Yes. You forgot me. Mr. Daniel? Yes. <laughs> the motion passes. <laughs> Thank you. Any more uh, cases or other business today? That's, that's all. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>